So I hope you had uh, an interactive session with uh, Professor Sridhar Iyer. Um, we will talk a little bit more about these sessions when I discuss the homework uh, tomorrow. So for now, we will uh, get back to the schedule which is uh, I will right now give you an overview of the upcoming lab in the afternoon. After that, we will again do some question and answer session based on both the labs as well as the concepts. So the upcoming lab is on socket programming. Uh, if you want to write any networking application, be it a web client, web server or email application or chat sessions or peer to peer applications, socket programming is a must. So, Socket programming as such, you could do it in uh, Java, you could do it in C, you could do it in C++, you could do it in Python. We often when we hand it to our students, we ask them to write in C, C++ because that is when they get to know a lot of the internal details. Java hides many aspects to at uh, the higher layers, it just opens uh, very few clean APIs. Uh, but when you start coding in C++, you get exposed to a lot of the internal details. Python is something that people have started to use now that is also pretty good. Um, you could, uh, it is clearer than C++, but uh, up to you, you could do socket programming in any of these uh, languages. But for now, we will focus on doing it in uh, C. So what this exercise is basically you are going to write a very simple file transfer protocol uh, using socket programming. So file transfer protocol is a client server based architecture. So there is a client, there is a server. So the role of the server is rather simple, it is basically going to be running on a machine waiting for incoming TCP connections, listening on a specific port. Uh, you are not going to use the port corresponding to FTP because that is a standard port you cannot normally use it at the application layer. So we will use another uh, application approved port for example 5000. So the server is listening on this port waiting for connections and what the client does is the client is going to read a file name from standard input. So when you run the client program. Uh, it will ask you for what file you want, so you type it in and then what the client does is it is going to establish a TCP connection to the server and as part of this TCP connection, it is going to send this file name to the server. Now what the server does is it is going to read this uh, string that has come from the client that represents the file name and it is going to see for the corresponding file. If the file exists at the server, it is going to transfer the file to the client and then it will close the connection for the client and wait for the next connection from another client. So this is what you need to do. This is kind of listed all in this particular socket programming instruction sheet. So what we are going to do is, uh, I mean this is just a 3 hour lab. If you are not at all familiar with socket programming, it can get overwhelming. So what I would suggest is you, I had already provided a video on socket programming. If you have not already gone through it, spend some time going through it. It is not a very long video. There are also slides provided as part of uh, that particular concept. You can also go through the slides. Apart from this, even to make things even further easier, we have provided a template of the particular program. So this is a client template that has been provided to you. So you download it and as you can see, it is a fill in the blanks. All you need to do is fill in the blanks based on your understanding of the socket programming. As I said, a uh, lot of these functions are available in the slides as well. So you need to go through the slides, understand what each function does and accordingly fill up the blanks in here. A few things to note in this context. So ideally you should try your client on one machine and server on another machine. But at the beginning, I would suggest that you run both of them on the same machine. 
when you are running both the client and the server on the same machine and you want them to communicate, you need to use this loopback address or the local host address as the destination address. So both the client and server are running on the same machine. They may be listening on, uh, the server may be listening on some random port, let's say 5000 and the client is going to contact the server on the port 5000. So this communication is going to happen within the host and you still need to deal with IP addresses thereby you are going to use the loopback address which is 127.0.0.1 as the uh, IP address. Now once you check that your program is running correctly within your uh, machine, you can pair up with your neighboring team and use their machine so you could run client on your machine and the server on their machine and test it. Uh, similarly, they could also do similar testing uh, using your machine. So when you are using uh, another machine, you do need, need to change the destination IP address corresponding to the IP address of your neighbor's machine. So this is with respect to the socket programming uh, assignment. So a quick recap, go through the video, go through the slides, the template has been provided. So understand what is expected, fill in the details in the template um, and then execute the code, run within your local host first using the loopback address. Once it is working fine, pair up with someone, run on different machines and ensure that it is uh, working correctly. So I am now open for uh, taking questions related to the lab first. So we will have this session till maybe. Uh, 12, 10 or something, after that we will do concept based questions. Ma'am, as we, I have gone through the NS2, so NS2 is developed in two languages, C++ and TCL, so how these languages communicate and pass the parameter to each other? Okay. So in turn, as I said, the front end is TCL, which is basically used for setting configuration parameters. So as part of TCL, you are going to set certain, uh, uh, your, for example, you may set a link bandwidth to be 1 Mbps, delay to be 50 milliseconds, so on. So all these parameters are set via the TCL script. So internally, there is a, uh, what is it called, a thing that reads the TCL script, extracts these values and passes them to the uh, appropriate uh, modules as arguments. So that is within the internal, it is kind of hidden unless you are doing coding um, where you are trying to do things within NS2, uh, it is not quite obvious to someone who is basically using the simulator to run uh, well known examples. In NS2 while doing practicals, when we configure a network, a node communicates to a, another node which is a destination but we do not give any, we do not assign any IP address to the nodes. So uh, we are confused like how the node actually do the discovery process in NSQ because no way we are assigning any IP addresses. We are simply creating the nodes, we are creating the assigning the agents to the node. So how this mechanism of IP address actually is involved in NS2? We are not uh, aware of that. So NS2 actually, I mean it is in fact one of the drawbacks of NS2 in that it does not deal with IP addresses. So identity, the node ID which is node 1, node 2, whatever ID you are giving is what is used as the address for that particular node. So when you are creating links between nodes and you are uh, specifying uh, all that, even for if you see when you are setting up TCP, you specify uh, within a node, you are linking up the TCP sync and you are making explicitly connections between who the TCP source is, who the TCP sync is. Um, and you are specifying through the tickle exactly where these things are. So uh, as you specify that it establishes internally that, uh, mm, that uh, this is the originator of TCP and uh, the sync is in that particular uh, node. So there is no major concept of routing, uh, I mean there are routing protocols also but if the kind of program that you have handled, the simulation that you have handled, there is no specific. Uh, routing. In other words, it is kind of a static routing. It is hard coded that packets from here, if there is a path along the links, it will uh, just figure out that particular path and give it to the other end. It was a basic topology of three nodes and four nodes. So like uh, we tried to uh, also analyze the packet, but we could not find any IP stealer. We thought maybe some default IP is being assigned. 
like you were saying, every node has an ID. Uh, yes. uh, there is a discovery mechanism, but we tried to analyze that we could not find anything, it even in yesterday's there. topology. It is not there. As I said, there is no concept of IP addresses. So if you see the TC, the tickle, the trace file of NS2, you will see some of the source and destination which is indicated as 0, 0.0 and 1.0, something like that. So that the first 0 refers to node ID, which you can view it as an IP address and dot 0 that 0 can be view, viewed as a port and uh, interpreted accordingly. As I said this is NS2 is a simulator it has not quite been modeled based on the actual working of the internet. Uh, this is Sunil Shinde from KLMS Society Engineering College Belgium. So is there any uh, tool to generate TCL scripts? Tool to generate TCL scripts? I mean, I mean you depends upon what is it, there is no TCL scripts are based on the user who wants to use the simulator what parameters he wants to give. So you could basically write some bash scripts to uh, what is it called create a configuration file. For example, if you want to uh, create a topology consisting of n number of nodes and uh, there is some structure to that particular node, you could write a bash script to generate a TCL script based on that particular topology. Or if you are fine, for example, doing some experiment which involves some random, for example, you want to do uh, use random seeds, uh, for which again in the TCL you may have to specify what that random number is. So again you could write a bash script uh, to come up with the random numbers and thereby uh, write the uh, tickle script based on bash scripting. But you need to be very clear on what exactly is it that the tickle script, it is more or less like you want to generate the output in a particular fashion that forms the TCL thing, you could either write a C code or bash script or whatever it is to generate the tickle script of interest to you. Dragging and dropping the nodes or links and we can generate any TCL script, that is what I was asking. That is what I am saying, so you have specific topology in mind and you want to generate a tickle script that captures that particular topology. So you can write C program or you can use bash scripting to generate such a tickle script in NS2. NS3 as I said probably has a GUI which will permit you to create topologies without too much uh, effort. Hello. Yes ma'am, my question is that in the MOOCs model, uh, if the uh, take is very large, so it is very tough to interact the one to one students. So how we can implement this for a uh, intake of 90 or 60 students batch? I have covered it as part of the flipped classroom lecture. Typically even here at IIT Bombay we deal with 100 uh, undergrad students in a class. Uh, so in a flipped classroom setting they watch the videos wherever what they want, it is not really one on one there. So when they come to the face to face tutorial, I basically divide up the class into three groups whereby I am handling only about 30 to 35 students at a time um, and I give more one on one to them in the face to face interaction. Uh, I had the question that few of the commands in TCP dump and Wireshark are not working in few terminals here. Can that be because of the firewall that is installed in the LAN here? You need to be more, I need more details on what actual commands did not work. TCP dump dash w, that command is not working. Can that be because of the firewall? Nothing. TCP dump is very local to your uh, machine. If TCP dump uh, minus w, you have to give an argument which is the file name. So first of all, you need to ensure that you have given, you have uh, given the right command. In other words, minus w should be followed by a file name. Uh, if you have not given naturally, it will complain. The second is even if you have given it and uh, it is uh, uh, not able to write to the file, you have to check that uh, the file has the right permissions that in other words TCP dump has the permissions to write into files. Uh, it is a local thing, I do not think anything external has to do with it. Ma'am, I am having the question that uh, if we are doing the send udp.c using that this file when we are sending the file. Uh, with the size of 4000 byte, that time we need to check that what are the different IP fragments are there. So I have checked that there are, it's uh, in the works are, it's showing that four protocol 
to IPv4, one UDP and one ICMP. ICMP for unreachable port. Mm -hmm. But to IPv4, it's giving that uh, site 14, 1480, 18. and in the UDP, when he clicked UDP, that time it's uh, giving the remaining sizes. It's okay, but how it's each and every protocol having the four layer protocol, UDP also it's having the IPv4, IPv4 protocol also having IPv4, IPv4 and ICMP also having the IPv4. So how works are each giving the protocol name as only IPv4, UDP, ICMP? So Wireshark has lot of internal details where it uh, makes use of, uh, so for example, it will examine the link layer uh, frame type and it will specify it as the up, upper protocol is IP based on that it will display the upper packet as an IP packet. So Wireshark has lot of this uh, information uh, encoded as part of it. So it can detect what are all the application protocols by looking at the port number. It will detect whether it is ICMP or IP or something else based on what the, uh, the frame type is within the link layer. So it has all that intelligence uh, embedded within it. So based on that it can uh, make sense of uh, what packet corresponds to which protocol. Ma'am, yes, in yesterday exercise lab 4, is there any type identifier available in trace file to find how many number of packets are sent? So there is an identifier, so uh, the last, I mean I have to pull up, I do not have the trace with me, but uh, each packet that is generated uh, has a unique identifier assigned as part of uh, uh, NS2. So there, it, that is also listed as part of the trace, it goes by the name A sequence or something, this I think is the very last field or something. Uh, so packets have sequence numbers, uh, those uh, appear as part of sequence numbers, but sometimes if a packet is lost, you retransmit the packet with the same sequence number. So the sequence number may be the same, but this A sequence number will be different because it is a new packet gen that was generated within NS2. So depending upon the sequence numbers, you could uh, calculate, depends upon what your goal is. If you want to know how many packets were fully generated, you just have to look at uh, the sequence number. But if you want to know how many packets were actually uniquely generated, then you have to look at the A sequence number to figure that out. I mean the uh, second exercise yesterday, uh -huh. there was a question to plot a graph using the trace file of the GNU plot. So uh, the GNU plot could not give the clarified, matlab, exact result, the clear result. So is there any other way by which we can plot a graph? Plotting graphs, GNU plot is just a utility. You could use the Excel, you could use uh, open office equivalent which is Xcalc, you could use Xgraph, you could use any plotting tools that are there, out there, whatever you are comfortable with. I mean original file, can we transfer the, in spite of sending the packets, can we transfer the file? Yes, I mean NS2 you could potentially uh, write I do not know if it already has, but it is definitely feasible to use NS2 to do it, where you can write a application where instead of artificially generating data, it, you can ask it to read from a file and send it. I do not know this, if FTP uh, permits that, uh, that option, I, it has been ages since I have uh, coded anything in NS2. But uh, if it uh, does, it, there could very well be such a feature as part of NS2. But if it is not there, uh, all I am saying is you could very easily even write a module that does it for you at the C++ level. Then, um, what is the logic for getting the half count from the trace file? Trace file hmm? What is the logic for? Getting the half count from the trace file. Half we got count? the trace file, hmm? from that can we estimate the half count? What is half count? Half count. Hmm? Half count. That is number of. Huh. Which trace file are you talking about? Trace root or uh, NS2 trace trace file? NS2 trace file. NS2 trace file, as I said, uh, yeah, you could potentially figure out by the how many hops a particular packet has taken by following the nodes that the packet has crossed. As I mentioned, each packet has a unique sequence number or a sequence number. You have to write a script that uh, 
find out where all are the entries, the lines that the packet is listed and then look at who the source destination is and you can figure out what the hop count is. It is a matter of writing an appropriate script or a C code to evaluate the trace file to get that information. Uh, Ma'am, I want to ask question that whenever we are creating socket, what type of file changes occur in the system and if there is a separate socket file is created uh, in the machine, so how to check how many sockets are created from single machine? Okay, so what happens when you, uh, I mean I had mentioned this as part of the video also, whenever you are opening a socket, basically one can view it as opening a file except, so what happens in a regular uh, uh, program, you open a file, you write into it and you read from it. So basically that is how you manipulate files. So in uh, socket programming also, when you open a socket, you could think of it as opening a file. So whatever you send on that socket, you can view it as being written into that uh, file. And whenever uh, you are reading from a socket, you can view it as reading out of that particular file. So what happens internally is whenever you open a socket internally at the kernel level, you are going, depends upon if you say TCP socket or UDP, so con that is connection oriented or connectionless socket. Accordingly, if you mention it as a connection oriented socket, then you are going to establish a TCP connection uh, based on whatever information you have passed in creating that particular socket. So in then whatever uh, data you are going to write into the socket, the TCP will take it into the buffer and send it out based on uh, who the destination address you have specified in creating the particular socket. So once you have this interface of a socket, you are just pushing data into it and pulling data from it. Internally, TCP is going to manage that particular data. Uh, that is what is going to happen. So you are regarding your next question as to uh, what are the sockets that are present in a particular host, netstat, N-E-T-S-T-A-T, uh, netstat is a command that you could use for uh, figuring out uh, what are the sockets that are listening, what are the sockets that are open. It is again a very sophisticated command, you can figure out lot of information with it. But netstat is a command that will tell you lot of information about the connections. It will tell you how many TCP connections are in established phase, how many are in time weight state. It will tell you what are the ports on which um, you are listening. All that information it will tell. So you can explore that command further to figure out this information. While once socket is executed, suppose we are using C programming, so their object file is created. So can we consider that object file is a treat as a socket file or separate socket file type format is available in the system and if available, how to check where is that particular socket file is present? So there is nothing called socket, I, when I made an analogy with the file, it is just an analogy. It is not that there is a socket file sitting in there, socket is like a... Uh, at the kernel level when you are opening a socket, I am saying you could view it as a file uh, uh, creation, but there is not anything called a socket file that is sitting there. It is just an interface through which you are passing packets from the application layer to the transport layer. There is no file for you to look at. Ma'am, I had one doubt, uh, our final year students are asked one question, what is 543 rule? Okay, so I think this is uh, in the context of Ethernet uh, length, if I am, I mean, uh, so Ethernet has uh, a rule called, uh, is it, I mean, I, I, I mean, it's a, you have to specify the context in which it was also asked also. 543 rule, I think is uh, maybe 500 meters, 4 repeaters, something like that in the in Ethernet context that captures what is the uh, maximum length you can support in Ethernet. Uh, what is a triple X in networks and they have asked the P, uh, packet assembler and assembler also ma'am. See all this, uh, there should be some context behind it. Assembler, yeah there are many packets, many places where you assemble packets and deassemble packets which could mean you are stripping off the headers, adding headers, uh, creating packets. Um, so unless you provide more context it's not easy to answer the question. Uh, I am uh, uh, ma'am, uh, the title of this workshop is uh, Introduction to Computer Networking. 
but even though some interesting facts have been given regarding computer networking during the lab assignments but i am wondering that most of the emphasis has been on the teaching methodology so don't you think that uh, the title could have been uh, into uh, the teaching methodology in uh, in general and uh, some other courses specific to technical contents as a separate course so i won't quite agree with you because there was one month phase which was the equivalent of uh, one week of uh, potentially these workshops used to be conducted two weeks where the one week has been put up on the online phase and the online phase was anything but teaching so you have learned lot of computer networking concepts even if during this one week of face to face if you see uh, we are spending only the uh, morning sessions which is about 1 and 1/2 hours in a 6 hour uh, day schedule on something related to teaching i thought it was important to include the teaching component because we are all teachers we are learning all these concepts we are learning all the stuff so finally you have to deliver based to your students based on uh, what you have learned so if you look at it out of two weeks uh, equivalent of work uh, the amount of and if you say 6 hours per day roughly so it is something like 6 into 6 uh, uh, so let's say 6 hours per day and we have uh, 12 days so that's the total amount of work amount of time we have hardly spent uh, uh, what i would call is maybe some uh, 7 8 hours on teaching so i think it's a very small percentage of the total amount of time spent on teaching methodologies that is ma'am in case of socket programming as it is protocol independent method and it on incorporates connectionless and connection oriented packet transfer among the processes hmm. how can i detect the connectionless and connection oriented packets um, uh, through the results so see so when you are doing socket programming you are explicitly specifying whether you want connection less or connection oriented so that is in your control once you specify whatever it is connection less or connection oriented then connection oriented will generate tcp packets connection less will generate udp packets and if you were to run tcp dump or anything you will see the fact that whether you have used connection oriented or connection less based on whether you are seeing tcp packets or udp packets Good afternoon, ma'am. Yeah. Madam, is there any procedure or tool to change the MAC address of <laughs> network card? Yes, it is very much possible to change the MAC address of uh, network card. For example, if you are using Ubuntu, there is the slash etc. network interfaces uh, file. You can specify the MAC address in there. I mean, there is a specific format you have to specify it in. Uh, I will leave it up you for you to figure it out. And then naturally after you change that file you have to restart the network services. Uh, you can just google I think it is uh, it will be there in many places. So based on that you can definitely change your uh, MAC address. That is in uh, Ubuntu. Windows also there will be similar such mechanism. So first question is uh, regarding trace path. So in trace path as already you have mentioned so that is some routers are uh, maybe refusing to send the ICMP messages. So exactly what is the specific reason behind the same? Is it for the security reason or something else? So lot of times, uh, the, I mean there is a good reason why they do not want to indulge in this type of thing because routers are, you want your routers to be extremely fast where they are uh, spending useful time forwarding packets rather than dealing with this kind of uh, additional uh, work. And it is also a security concern. Sometimes, for example, you could bring down a router just by pumping lot of ICMP type of where it has to reply. You could just bring down the router based on that kind of. Uh, so you could launch an attack based on uh, expecting it to reply based on ICMP. Uh, in which case, uh, you could bring down a router because all its CPU is being used in uh, uh, replying to these particular messages. So there is a security angle and sometimes even for performance issues where they, you do not want the router to do unnecessary work and let it focus on what it is intended for which is forwarding and so on. So that is one of the reasons why uh, routers do not implement it. So when you go for uh, talking about a switch, okay. so let us say uh, 
based on what parameters exactly i should go for uh, whether it is a layer 2 switch i should i should go for or uh, layer 3 switch see it depends upon uh, what your intended goal is also so for example if okay so let's say there is this department which is the csc department and then there is another department which is the ee department and then what you want to do is you want to interconnect both these departments so if you were to use a switch layer 2 switch to interconnect them more or less what you are doing is you are forming an extended lan so whatever broadcast messages that are going to uh, be sent in csc will also reach ee similarly uh, ee broadcast messages are also going to reach csc if the number of people in csc ee are less maybe this is fine but if the number of people are more or they have some other concerns you don't want to use a layer 2 switch to interconnect them in which case you should do a layer 3 switch which is basically a router that will not pass such traffic between them so it's a question of the scalability the number of hosts the cost layer 2 switches are cheaper than routers the maintenance so system administrators have to think of many of these things in deciding whether to use a layer 2 switch or a layer 3 switch uh, in the network animator uh, we are doing packets in the forward direction and uh, with respect to the time slot now when does the time bar time bar uh, is uh, slided backwards uh, the packets are moving uh, in the opposite direction so our concentration is generally from source to destination uh, at the packet transfer is so why that uh, why that is happening actually why the reverse of the transfer is uh, is happening in the video in the animation I don't know exactly, I mean unless you show me what is happening, it's difficult for me to comment on. But typically if you are moving the time scale on the network anim animator, all you are doing is uh, asking the network animator to start the simulation at that particular time. So when you are moving from uh, forward to the back, uh, it is kind of, uh, you know, this is like uh, in videos, it is like rewinding kind of a thing and from that point on it will start to play again. Um, so unless I see what exactly you are uh, talking about, it's not easy to answer. Yeah, this is regarding socket programming. Huh. Um, whether people are still using the socket programming to send the data from source to destination, or they have moved to some other concept or technology? No, socket programming is the default. I mean, everyone, if you want to write any network application, you need to use socket programming. Uh, that also goes by the name network programming. So. But there are different, uh, see underneath it all is C, uh, some C libraries and C++. Uh, just to make things easier, you will see, uh, you could do it in Java as well as Python. But they are uh, interfacing with some C++ modules uh, internally. So yeah, socket programming is very much the, the thing that you are going to use to uh, write networking applications. One more, one more question huh? hmm. regarding the socket programming. Huh. Uh, when you write the client server programs, sometimes we mention the destination IP address as a, a low back address like 127.0.0.1. Yeah. And sometimes we also mention the destination IP address as 0.0.0.0. Can you throw some light on these two IP addresses? 0.0.0.0. Yes, ma'am. That's the destination IP address. Destination IP address 0.0.0.0. Uh, I mean, there is no such, where exactly, I mean, I have never seen it being used in the country. Whenever you do socket programming, when you are specifying destination, you will either specify a local host, which is the loopback address, or a valid destination IP address, which could be your neighbors, uh, uh, let's say 10.129 or whatever, it will not be 0, 0, 0, 0. Local host address is also working, like 127.0.0.1. Huh. And as, at the same time, this 0, 0.00 is also working, and I couldn't understand the difference. What do you mean working where? It is working. Using what? It, it is working similar to the loopback address 127.0.0.1. In place of that, this 0, 0, 0, 0 is also no, working. In, I mean, uh, some transmission is taking place. In when you used what code? Send UDP? Or are you talking about the socket programming code? In what context is it that you are talking socket about? Socket programming. Huh? In the socket programming, in By the client program, 
uh, in the destination IP address, Which we client use program? 127.001. You wrote the client program or the client program that I have provided? Yes, yes. In your in in the program that you have provided, it is mentioned as 127.00. I got okay, fine. I got confused. Yeah. So the thing is, when you are writing socket programming, when you specify the IP address as 0 .0 .0 .0, 0.0.0.0, that is an indication to the kernel that see, I don't know at the higher level what my IP address is. You figure out internally what the IP address is and put it in the packet. Okay, so that is uh, just saving you some effort when you are writing socket programming. But if you are actually sending out a packet, there will not be for example, when you are executing the client C and you have to specify who the destination is, you cannot specify 0.0.0.0 because that is not a valid IP address. But internally when you are writing the socket programming, if you do not know what your IP address is, if you specify 0.0.0.0 when you are opening the socket. Internally, the kernel will figure out the IP address for you and put it in that particular packet, whatever it is sending out. Does that clarify? Yes, yes. Huh. That means we can use 000 also. Yeah, you could use, or you could even Not find out and that. give it. it. It doesn't matter. You either you give or you let the kernel choose for you. Uh, Madam, I have a question regarding socket programming. In socket programming, uh, there is a warning term like segmentation fault. Why uh, it occurs when in, in the case, uh, when we write the socket program, like uh, client server or client program or server program, uh, sometimes uh, uh, a kind of a uh, warning or error comes like segmentation fault. So why this type of error comes? Okay. Segmentation fault means you have done something uh, uh, wrong in uh, so you are see whenever you deal things at the kernel level uh, it depends upon what program you have written. If you are uh, creating packets and uh, not clearing up the memory it can result in segmentation fault. Um, especially in the kernel space if you do not pass proper arguments sometimes or the buffer gets overflowed many things can cause segmentation fault. But that uh, reminded me of uh, wanting that I should mention some other thing with respect to the socket programming assignment. Uh, this is a generic thing which all the remote centers should pay attention. So sometimes what you will see is uh, you run the server on let us say port 5000 and then you kill the server because uh, you want to rerun it again uh, for whatever reason. Then you will see an error that says bind failed. When, when you try to bind the particular port 5000 again, you will say that the bind has failed. Uh, this arises because of the TCP state maintenance. So typically TCP waits in this uh, state called time wait state for uh, up to uh, 60 seconds, it depends upon again it is an implementation parameter. So during this time if you are trying to run the server again and asking it to bind on that particular port, the bind is definitely going to fail. So there are uh, two options or even multiple options here. One is wait for some time at least uh, one minute uh, or two minutes and rerun the server. The other is if you do not want to wait use a different port, do not use the same port as you have used earlier. The third option is you could handle it via socket programming itself by uh, uh, I mean there is some code that will prevent this bind uh, fail error. I won't get into those details. So the third option is for advanced people who want to figure that out on their own. But uh, when you are doing it, if you see this error, be wary that such an error may come. In which case, uh, you have to either wait or change the port. Including this, I have another confusion. How application port number differs from protocol port number? And uh, in the time of socket programming, is uh, um, whether we can. Uh, Trace the traffic to where, sir? So, the first question is any port under 1024 is a reserved port. Uh, you cannot use it at the application layer. You can only use it if uh, you have root permissions and for example, if you are writing a web server, then you can use port 80. But typically for the kind of exercises we do, all the ports under uh, 1024 are reserved. So, you cannot touch any of those ports. 
Now regarding your question of uh, feeding traffic into Wireshark, as I said while, while you are doing the server client communication, you can definitely run Wireshark TCP dump to see what are the packets that are getting exchanged. So I mean I, I keep telling this again and again, Wireshark TCP dump are utilities when you run from the time you ran till the time you stop it, whatever packets are going out or coming in to your interface, it will just make a log of it. That is what TCP dump or Wireshark does. And if you want to capture packets that are going on the local loopback uh, address, which is the local host address, if you directly run TCP dump, it will not capture those packets because they are not going out of your uh, interface. You need to be uh, use minus ILO, which is the loopback interface for you to capture those packets. It may not work in, by the way, I won't be surprised if in some systems it did not work. Now, one more question. In NS2, in NS2 simulation, is it possible to simulate any kind of existing network topologies or not? Any type of? Topology, topology. Yeah, I mean, you can create, uh, um, yeah, any complex topology, yeah, it's definitely possible to create different topologies as part of uh, NS2. In fact, NS2 also has uh, um, models for uh, mimicking mobility and stuff. So, yeah, you could create topologies in NS2. So, actually, we will uh, stop here with respect to the lab and we will take up some concept based uh, questions. Uh, so, we will take some questions that were asked uh, earlier through the remote centers. So, this question is from remote center 1279. So, the question was can same IP address be given to a host as well as a router? If not, will it work? If not, why? And suppose we want to add 200 systems in a network with one IP address, is it possible through subnetting or supernetting? Okay, so the answer is IP address is a unique address which you are giving to one specific interface. If you assign the same IP address to multiple interfaces be it within the same host or be it uh, to different uh, host and a different router, things will not work because the routing protocol will get confused as to where it should send the packet to. So, each interface needs to have a unique IP address. So, that is the basis for uh, routing. Now, the question about can I add 200 systems in a network with one IP address through subnetting or supernetting? So, I, th I think some of the people have confusion about what is IP address and what is IP address mask. So, when you say I have one IP address, which means all the four fields. Um, so, for example, 15.14.1.27 is an IP address. Now, I have filled in all the bits as part of this particular IP address. Now, this IP address you can assign to one host. You definitely cannot assign to 200 either through subnetting or supernetting or whatever it is that you want to do. If you want to use subnetting, you basically need a mask which is 14.1. star. If you have something like this where this has been assigned to your organization, when they are assigning this, they are saying you can use all these 8 bits that are here and 2 to the power of 8 users you can assign, thereby you can support 200 users. So, this is what I would call a class address, this is a specific IP address. So, if you are given something like this, you can definitely use subnetting to assign for the 200 users. If you are given something like uh, this, which is a complete IP address that is specific only to, that can be given only to one host. That said, there is something called NAT, which I have not covered as part of the course, but we do have a video on this as well. Through the use of NAT, you could use one IP address as part of some gateway, where internally there are these 200 hosts. Each of them have a private IP address. It is not that they do not have any IP addresses, they have a private IP address that could be in this 10 dot star dot star uh, domain. This is a private IP address space, but this can have just one single IP address. And you can still manage using this configuration to communicate 
to the outside world as well as uh, receive communication uh, mes messages from the outside world. So this is possible through something called NAT, but in general if you are dealing with public IP addresses, one single IP address will not permit you to, uh, multiple hosts to use the same IP address. So another question that was asked is when you ping the loopback address, a packet is sent where? Um, this is from remote center 1090. So when you ping a loopback address, what is basically happening is the following. So you have, this is your kernel with all this uh, network layer, link layer, so on and so forth. And you have generating at some user space, you did some ping. So some packet got generated, it's come down. When it is loopback, it is going to go up again. So that is the concept of a loopback. So it will come all the way. It didn't go out by the way it does not come to the physical layer it just goes out in this fashion yeah so it takes a loop back at the link layer itself it does not quite go out through the network interface. Uh, in this context uh, someone earlier has asked this 127.0.1.1 uh, I am answering that question also now itself at that time I was very confused because I have never seen this uh, uh, address before. And I thought maybe it was there for some IPv6 backward compatibility issue. But apparently I dug up a little bit more as to what this address is. This address is very much specific to Ubuntu. In other words, you will not, it is an operational specific address that has been created to handle some bug with GNOME application. It has got no relevance other than the fact that uh, just to uh, ensure some compatibility with the GNOME that is used as part of Ubuntu, they have to specify this IP address. Otherwise, it has no relevance as far as concepts are concerned. Okay. This question has come from remote center 1269. Why does not BGP use link state or distance vector? So BGP is a protocol that is going to interconnect different autonomous systems. Its goals are very different. Uh, link state sorry BGP does use something called path vector which is a bit similar to distance vector but uh, you specify the entire path. Uh, I won't get into the details but at a high level the reason why BGP does not use link state and distance vector is link state and distance vector are more for finding a path uh, efficient path between a source and a destination. Whereas the role of BGP is to find any path that satisfies certain policies. The policies will be dictated by financial arrangements whether someone is a customer or someone is a provider or the kind of competition they have across the uh, autonomous systems and so on and so forth. Efficiency is the least thing in their mind when they are uh, trying to do routing. That is why BGP does not use link state or distance vector. More details are available in the BGP video that has been made available as part of the uh, concepts. So we will move on to the another question. So this question was asked by remote center 1333 which is basically postal addresses are geographical addresses what about IP addresses. So this is actually the same question that I have asked as part of a concept uh, within the Bodhi tree. But I think it is an important question, so still I am going to answer it. Uh, postal address as you see there is a geographical like if you, you specify like this country, this state, this city, within the city, this particular uh, pin code. So there is lot of geographical information that is captured as part of postal addresses. Whereas IP addresses there is not anything geographical about it. For example, you may assign one subnet mask or any IP address today in Bombay and tomorrow if the service provider decides to take that thing and uh, assign to someone in Delhi that is also very much uh, feasible. So the routing protocols will figure out where uh, that particular uh, IP address is through this exchange of messages and thereby direct traffic. That said, so that the conclusion is IP addresses are not geographical in scope, but that said, often they do not vary that much with time. So if the provider is using certain IP addresses uh, within Bombay, they stay static for a relatively long period of time. So there are a lot of uh, services that make use of this geographical information 
to um, serve. So, for example, um, I think I was giving the speed net dot speed test dot net um, for you to check out the internet speed. So, when you do that, it will actually figure out that um, ping to some uh, server that is closer to your. So, if for example, I execute it as part of my computer, it will give me some Mumbai server for me to ping to and do this test. Now, how did it figure out that it should give me a Mumbai uh, uh, server based on my IP address. So, it knows that from wherever I have sent information this it has a database that keeps track of this type of information and based on the database it will provide me a server to do my speed test uh, based on location. Okay, this question has come from center 1224. The question is IP protocol being connectionless, how does it provide a connection oriented service to the TCP protocol? Now, IP protocol I had mentioned is a best effort service, there is no connection establishment for you to send packets, you just send packets based on the destination address, it will just forward the packets, um, there is not any connection. Then how is it providing connection oriented service to TCP? It is providing, it is not providing any connection oriented service to TCP, in fact TCP is the one that is connection oriented. It is connection oriented because it is maintaining lot of state related to the connection. You saw that SYN, SYNAC, ACK, that exchange, the TCP handshake is a way of exchanging information about the connection before you even start sending the data. So, TCP is a connection oriented protocol because between the two endpoints before you start sending the data, you are doing some handshaking to exchange some state information. Whereas, the same you are not doing at the IP level. IP you just generate a packet and push it, it will based on the destination it will forward the packet. Another question that was asked was what is the scope of the protocol such as ARP, RARP, RARP, ICMP, IGMP with the establishment of IPv6 uh, networks. So, let me get into a little bit of detail there. So, ARP uh, I have uh, again not shared with you the IPv6 videos, but the ARP is redundant. In fact, it has no use in IPv6. It is because ARP has been replaced by another protocol called Neighborhood Discovery Protocol NDP, uh, which is part of the IPv6. So, there is no use of ARP. By which I mean there is definitely use for the functionality of ARP. In other words, you still need to determine what the MAC address is corresponding to an IP address, except that IPv6 is not using the ARP protocol, but it is using another protocol called uh, NDP to achieve the task. So, NDP does something very similar to ARP, except that it is based on ICMP messages rather than uh, the way ARP handles it. RARP is an outdated protocol, in fact it is not used anymore, it has been superseded by the DHCP uh, protocol, so we will not get into that. It has no context even in IPv6. Uh, the other protocol is ICMP, uh, ICMP was there in IPv4, it is also there in IPv6, except that a few additional ICMP type codes have been added to take care of some of the IPv6 features. For example, this NDP protocol I was mentioning uh, needs certain type of ICMP code types. So, there have been new code types associated with uh, the NDP protocol. Um, that said, there is also the fragmentation, IP fragmentation has been removed in IPv6 to ensure that the routers are not burdened with this functionality. So, I, uh, fragmentation is not there as part of uh, um, IPv6, but then it is also the case that uh, you may encounter links that have an MTU size smaller than the IP packets, you still have to solve the problem. The way it is solved in IPv6 is again through ICMP messages, so they have defined a new ICMP type called packet too big. Based on this uh, you handle the MTU uh, problems. So, I do not want to get into too many details, but this is at a high level what is happening as part of IPv6. The third, fourth thing that was asked is what is the role of IGMP as part of IPv6. IGMP is a protocol that uh, manages multicast, 
Uh, it is again uh, applicable in IPv4 networks. It is again not used in IPv6. IPv6 has another protocol called multicast listening uh, discovery or some such protocol. I don't remember the name, but uh, uh, that is a protocol that has replaced IGMP in IPv6. So this question has come from remote center 1007. So when the TCP IP configuration file has the information of subnet mask and default gateway to find whether the destination packet is belonging to the same or different subnet, what is the need for host routing table in the end host when routing is really performed by the gateway router? See, I mean this is a bit of a confusing question. If the question is if the routers have these forwarding tables and everything, why should the forwarding table be present in the host? If that is the question, as I said, you still need to determine whether this packet is within your subnet or outside your subnet and the way that is handled is through the routing table. So when you do root minus n, it gave you a bunch of information. Those are the rules that the host uses in sending information out. By the way, a computer need not have just your ETH0 interface, it can have multiple uh, interfaces, ETH0, ETH1, so on, or it could have a wireless interface as well as ETH0 interface. So when there are multiple interfaces as well as, uh, uh, you do need to figure out whenever you get a packet, whether you have to send it on this interface or that interface, or whether you should send it on the local area network or to the next hop router. So all these rules are managed by the routing within an end host. An end host can be a source or a destination. So sometimes it is a source when it initiates the connections. Sometimes it is a destination when others initiate the connection. So no matter what, you need this information at the end host. So another, maybe this is the last question I will handle. Uh, is so this question is again dealing with IPv6. Is IPv6 more secure than IPv4? Uh, some say this one is more secure than the other, some other say some other thing is more secure. Uh, what is actually correct? IPv4 as well as IPv6 uh, rely on IPsec protocol that is a separate protocol. In other words, whether they should support it or not is uh, what is uh, uh, important. IPv4, the support for IPsec is optional whereas they have made it mandatory in IPv6. The fact that something, a security feature has been made mandatory in IPv6 means more people are going to start using that feature and with the hope that things will be more secure. As such IPv4 or IPv6 by themselves, they, they don't, uh, what is it called, uh, as far as the routing, forwarding, all those things are concerned, there are nothing security about it. It's more a question of whether they are integrating a security protocol rather mandating a use of security protocol or not. So one could potentially say that IPv6 is more secure because it has made the use of IPsec mandatory. So that's the question. So this has come from center 1152. What is the maximum capacity of Wi-Fi that users can be supported? See, it, it uh, is a function of many factors. So typically it is a function of how much capacity are you talking about 802.11b or g or n or uh, AAC whatever it is there are so many protocols that are out there. Typically beyond 20-30 users you will start to see problems uh, but again it is an active area of research where they do want to increase the number of uh, users. Um, so there is no straightforward answer. Typically beyond 20-30 when regular Wi-Fi that we see 802.11g is where you will, again depends upon what is it that they are doing. I mean if they are passive but if they are doing lot of uh, downloading, yeah it may even support only 20. So it is a function of the traffic patterns, the range, number of users, many other factors come into play. IPv6 implementation is getting delayed. It is not getting, people are using it, so most routers, most hosts these days do come with uh, IPv6. It is just that the transition is lot difficult because most of the, uh, you have to upgrade lot of, even if, if even though it is just a software upgrade, you have to upgrade lot of machines. Uh, most of the core routers are already changed, it is some of these edges 
that need uh, this change. So, it is it is slowly picking up it takes time it is uh, I mean we have been using IPv4 for a significant amount of time and uh, so many people have been using it. So, it takes time to change it is not easy to change ok I think we will end the uh, session now.